Hi guys, welcome to our third session of Biostats Made Simple. For those that haven't attended our previous sessions, I'm going to include the link in our chat for the slides that were used in previous presentations. Please be aware that recordings are also available online. So if you miss any session, you can always look at the re-recording. Just to introduce myself for those that haven't been here before, attended these webinars. My name is Christine Ramzan. I am a research faculty at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School, Department of Emergency Medicine. I've been here for the last six years and I'm very passionate about the work I do. I have a PhD in biomedical informatics and one of my job functions is to assist residents and early career faculty and anyone that needs any help with stats in healthcare research. So through way of these sessions, we hope to refresh you on some of the things that you may have learned and you have forgotten and accelerate those abstracts and those um, papers that have been struggling along due to basic stats. So I'd like to first thank Lane and Lynn and Society of Academic Emergency Medicine Foundation for allowing me to put, uh, do this. Really appreciate all your help and all your support. Um, one of the new things we're gonna do in this session compared to previous sessions is we're going to start looking at some problems using SPSS. And the real reason why we've made this, decided to make this kind of dramatic transition is I didn't want to start using a whole bunch of online calculators just to show you that you can do the same thing in SPS and it could be done so simply. So we figured we can just sh start showing you how to do it, start making uh, people feel comfortable. And towards the end of the year or a couple of months from now, when we're talking about regressions and stuff, everyone is just so comfortable using SPSS, they'll be like, I don't even need to watch this anymore. So that's the goal of the series. And we're always here to answer any questions. This session, we're going to focus on comparisons for scalar or ordinal variables. In comparison to the last section, where last se session will be focused on nominal variables. So with that being said, let's get started. So this is the agenda for today. We're going to do a recap on last session because sometimes this is just a lot when we're talking for an hour about the same thing. So we're just going to do a 10 minute quick refresher, 10 minute or less on what we talked about and use it to lead into what we're going to talk about in today's session, which is comparisons between groups of data with scalar or continuous variables, whereas the last sessions were comparison uh, of data between groups with nominal data. So we're going to focus on unpaired tests. What I mean by that is I'm sure some of you have heard of the paired t-test versus the regular t-test. Today, we're just going to focus on unpaired comparisons because paired comparisons are a whole separate set of tests, and we can we will discuss that in the next session. And we're going to talk about the non-parametric and the parametric comparisons for ordinal and scalar variables. Again, unpaired. We're going to update that table we started within the first session, and then we're just going to briefly summarize everything. Last session, we started with telling you guys a little bit about the descriptive statistics feature in Excel. I had introduced the idea of using commands in Excel to analyze some of your data, such as equals mean, equals median, equals mode, count if, equals ran between. There's just a bunch of different commands you can use Excel to get valuable insights from your data. However, with the descriptive statistics analytic tool pack that could be installed in Excel, a lot of descriptive statistics from your data, from your continuous or ordinal data, could be generated very quickly and very easily. Uh, if you'd like to know the steps on how to get that installed, please refer to the slides that were shared with you in the chat today. We also talked a little bit about Shapiro Wilkes test and how it's used. It's used for ordinal and Continuous or scalar data, when you're testing for data normality, if the p-value is greater than 0 0.05, your data set is considered to be normal, and you would use parametric tests to compare your data sets between groups. If the p-value for the Shapiro-Wilkes test is less than 0 0.05, you would use non-parametric tests to compare your data sets because that is an indication that your data sets are not normal. So... When we're comparing groups of nominal data, and when I mean, what I mean by that when I say nominal data is data with groups that can be separated into categories, right? So examples of nominal data include 
race, ethnicity, color, blood type, etc. So whenever you're comparing proportions between groups, like for example, if we're looking at blood type and we want to see if when two populations, one population had significantly more blood type O than the other population, we would have to, you know, find the proportion with blood type O in population A and find the proportion of blood type O in population B and compare that. The only way to represent nominal data is pretty much proportions. And this is why we use something called the chi-squared difference of proportions test. I showed you how to do that using Vassar stats, which is a very easy, convenient tool, especially if you're just writing an abstract and you just want to get this out and you don't have to literally state that I used SAS to you don't do my data analysis or SPSS. It's really quick and simple. And we're just going to briefly recap on what those different fields mean in Vassar stats to input your data. When the chi-squared difference of proportions test does not work for nominal data due to very small sample sizes, then you would use the alternative called Fisher's exact test, and we'll quickly review that. So when you go to Vassar stats, then you have your two groups of nominal data, and you need to compare proportions between the two data sets. You would have to input the values into the calculator so it can output a p-value to tell you if there's a statistical significant difference between groups. So here, my sample A would be my group A or whatever am I talking about. If it's bag A, wh whatever we're talking about, two groups with nominal data inside of it. So it could be two different types of races, two different types of uh, cities in the country, whatever our samples of our interest, these are um, represented by sample A or and sample B are two groups that we would like to compare. So KA would be the frequency of a parameter of interest in your sample A, while KB is the frequency of your parameter of interest in parameter B. Going back to my example with blood types, like if we're looking at a specific population sample A and we wanted to know the number of type O's in that specific group, KA would be the number of type O's in population A, and then KB would be the number of O's in population B. And remember, we want to keep it consistent. We don't want to mess up because when we're talking about blood types, we can have blood type A, blood type B, blood type O. We want to make sure we're comparing apples with apples and not apples with oranges unless that's the intent. So it's very important to have all of your data very organized. Our NA is the total number of people or total number of whatever we're looking at in the first sample. NB is the total number of people we're looking at in the second sample. And then all you have to do, those are the only four parameters you have to input. Once you click calculate, the calculator will um, give you your probability or your proportion for sample A of people, in this case, who have blood type O. And then it'll give you the proportion of people that have type O in uh, sample B. And so just looking at these proportions that they might be different, there's 57% of people and sample one, and there's 33% of people with that blood type in uh, sample two. However, how do you evaluate this for statistical significance? So the chi-square difference of proportion test does that. It gives you your one-tailed p-value and your two-tailed p-value, which will help you determine whether there is a difference and if that difference is statistically significant. Again, refresher, you use two-tailed values, two-tailed p-values, if you want to detect whether in general there's a difference, you use one-tailed p-values when there's directionality involved, meaning are you concerned if there's a significantly greater proportion of pe people that have blood type O and group A compared to group B, or if there's significantly less. So in either of those scenarios, when you're talking about directionality, you use one-tailed p-values. When you're not talking about directionality and you just want to know whether there's a difference, you use the two-tailed p-value. In cases where the chi-squared difference of proportions test doesn't work, and that's usually the case when the sample sizes for both groups are small, as you can see here, Vassar stats will give you an error because the statistical criteria for that test does not work. And that is your indication to use what you call the Fisher's exact test. And again, just a quick reminder, I showed um, everyone on the last video how to use Fisher's exact test using the social statistics calculator. Um, again, your group one and group B is this, uh, the same thing as your sample A and sample B. Um, social statistics allows you to label groups. 
So you would, you could label that bag one, bag two, population one, population two, whatever you want. Your category one is generally the frequency of your parameter of interest. Your category two is simply your total, the total number of people in that group, whatever the total is in that bag, whatever your total is, minus category one. That's all your category two is. And then you hit calculate and it gives you your Fisher's exact test value. And it even tells you if it's statistically significant or not. So in summary, that is how you conduct comparisons between groups of data that are represented by some nominal value. All right, so to transition over today, we're gonna to talk about comparisons for scalar, continuous, and ordinal variables. So again, quick examples, and you can see off the slide of scalar continuous variables, age, height, weight, ordinal variables could be very commonly your Likert scale data. That's one of the most common things we use in medical research, especially in survey studies, et cetera. School levels, like from K to 12, education level, grades. So those are examples of scalar and ordinal data. So these are the tests that are used to compare, again, unmatched groups of ordinal or scalar data. So what I mean by unmatched, I mean by not paired, right? So just think of it this way. If we're conducting a study looking at pre and post test scores for medical students, and we have the identifiers, if we have identifiers, we can actually conduct a paired analysis because we can link to that student's pre-score to that student's post score. When I say unmatched, I mean that we do not have the identifiers, meaning you cannot tell what student scored what the student scored on the first test and what that same student scored on the second test. So in that case, you can compare the data sets, but you would do something called unmatched analysis. So that's the focus of today's presentation. And there are, depending on the normality of the data, which we've spoken about before, and we've established that you use Shapiro-Wilkes test to determine normality of data, you use the data set could be parametric or non-parametric, and there is actually separate tests for each of them. So for parametric, if you use the Shapiro-Wilkes test and the result is greater than 0 0.05, meaning the data set's normal, that means you could use your two independent samples t-test because your data set is parametric. And this has to be true for both data sets, whether you're evaluating pre or post or group one or group two, in order to use the parametric data, the parametric test or the two independent samples t-test, your, your pre and post or your group one and group two both have to pass the Shapiro-Wilkes test for normality. If either one of them comes back not normal, you have to use the non-parametric alternative, which is the Mann-Whitney U test. Shapiro-Wilkes test could be used again for either scalar or ordinal data. So on the screen, I just have here scalar continuous data, and I have an example of Likert scale data, one through five there. It could be used to test either data set. In my experience, generally, when you're dealing with Likert scale data, you'll find that a majority of the times it comes back on the normality test not normal, but don't take my word for that. That's not a rule of thumb. You just, it depends on the distribution. You just use the Shapiro-Wilkes test to make that determination for you. Okay, so now with that being said, we're going to do some examples. So a pharmaceutical company developed a weight loss pill that has been tested via a randomized control trial to determine whether the pill had a significant impact on weight loss after six weeks. Group one was a group of patients that received a placebo treatment and group two was a group of patients that received the actual intervention. We have data and by actual intervention at the weight loss pill that's being tested. We have data on weights for each patient within both groups post six weeks. And we would like to determine whether there was a significant difference in weights between groups post six weeks. So our first step, when we're looking at the problem, and this might not, under, you might not understand why right now, because you'll think that we're thinking too much about this. Why do we care if it's ordinal or scalar? We know this is weights and we can just do a test. But when you use a software like SPSS, it actually becomes very important to differentiate between your data types. And the reason why is because SPSS will only appropriately run the test if you input the data and the data type correctly. And I'll show you how that works in just a second. So we would first, what we would do is input both data sets, pre and post data sets, or the data set for group one and the data set for group two into SPSS. We indicate whether those are scalar measures or ordinal measures or whatever or not. We're going to check the data normality for both data sets. 
And then we're going to determine what test to use depending on the normality. So with this being said, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and I'm going to share my screen for SPSS. So for those that have never seen SPSS before, this is what it looks like. It looks deceivingly like Excel. Do not be fooled. It's nice to look at and you can do a lot of nice things really easily, but it does not function the same way as Excel functions. For example, we all know Excel has a lot of data manipulation tools. For example, if we input a set of data into the first column in Excel, we can tell it to sort this data from smallest to largest. These uh, kind of functions are not easily done in SPSS. So my favorite combination is actually what one would call the SPSS and Excel combination, where I would have my original data set in Excel. I clean it, I manipulate it, I do whatever I need to do, and then have that beautiful, ready, nice data set copied and pasted into SPSS because it just makes life so much easier. SPSS is not made for data like manipulation and cleaning. It's made directly for analysis. So you just want to make sure that whatever you're putting into SPSS, the data is clean and it's represented the way you want to. One thing I do want to mention when you're working with real data sets, oftentimes you can have missing data. What you want to do is if you have that data in Excel document, you want to clearly indicate which data points are missing. So when you put it into SPSS, you can let SPSS know what data is missing and what's not. It helps it for analysis purposes as well, because when you run the analysis, it'll tell you what percent of your data is missing. And it actually has indicators that you can use to put in to indicate what data is missing. So this is what the screen looks like, and we're going to copy and paste data into this. One thing I need to bring your attention to is the tab at the bottom called variable view. Variable view helps you classify your data. So each row actually represents a column in the data view. So this column, when we copy and paste data here, is represented by row one in the variable view. So we'll have to input a name for whatever that column is. That's not something that could be easily done here. When you double click here to try to change the name of the cell, it takes you directly to the variable view. You would put the name of the column in here, whether it's weights or group one or group two or whatever it is right there. You would, if it was a nominal variable, there's a value function here. You would click on the value function and you would actually specify the name of each category within that nominal variable. N nominal variable. So you want to say that maybe group one represents blood type A and group two represents blood type B, so on and so forth. This is how it keep, helps you keep your data analyzed because SPSS does not like strings. So when you have blood type A, blood type B, or whatever that column may represent, you need to have that substituted by an, a number before you copy and paste it into SPSS. This is why Excel will never run away from you. It's your best friend because you can have all these types of stuff in Excel and Excel is not going to complain. But if you put this in SPSS, SPSS will complain it's not going to give you an analysis. You want everything nice and coded before you put it in here, especially when you're dealing with nominal variables. Now, since in our example, we're dealing with scalar and scalar variables, we don't have categories to indicate here for values. All we need to be concerned with is this column called measure. And measure, right now, it's not showing me scalar for whatever reason, but probably when I copy and paste the data, it will. It'll give you three types of options, the things that we have discussed over and over again for labeling your variable. The variable, it's asking you whether your variable that you're inputting into this column, is it scalar, is it nominal, or is it ordinal? And you have to select the appropriate value. And that just helps you stay organized as a researcher as well. One quick comment, if we were to do a Likert scale type analysis, you would put ordinal and you would also, in your values column, you would label the value for each measure in your Likert scale, right? So our values are generally one, two, three, four, five, and five represents maybe very much, and one represents not at all. So if you had ordinal data, you'd have to do that. But in our case, again, bringing it back to perspective, we're dealing with weights. So we're not dealing with ordinal data. So our measure here, for some reason now, it's letting me put scale. So we're going to put scale. Now I'm going to stop that for a minute, and I'm going to show you, copy and paste the data here, and show you guys how to use Shapiro-Wilkes test to keep this moving along. So I actually shared this random data with you guys in the shared drive in case you want to repeat some of the examples that we practiced on today. So you have the same thing that we're dealing with. So here's our group one. These are the patients that had placebo treatment 
for um, after six weeks. And these are their weights, a list of their weights, which I generated using the command I've said over and over again, ran between just to generate random numbers. And I specified that the person with the lowest weight would have 180 pounds. The, po the, high, the person with the greatest weight should have 270. So it gave me random weights between that range. And then group two, that's the group with our weight loss drug after six weeks. These are the range of weights. And I intentionally made it a little bit less to show that the weight loss pill work. Our range here is 150 to 230 pounds. So what I'm going to do is our first step, if you recall, to conduct the comparison is to determine the appropriate test. In order to determine the appropriate test, we have to use the Shapiro-Wilkes test. So I'm going to show you guys how to do that really quickly in SPSS. So I'm going to copy both data sets, copy and paste both into SPSS. So I'm going to paste that into SPSS, and I'm going to go to my variable view, and I'm going to label that group one so we don't get confused. And group one was our placebo. And I indicated that it's a scalar measure because we know weights are scalar measures. And now I'm going to copy my data for group two into the next column in our data view. I'm going to copy group two. And then we're going to label it group two intervention. And that is also scalar. See, one of the really important reasons why it's important to label the correct measure in SPSS if we try later to run the two sample t-tests, for example, SPSS, and then we have the wrong measure, if we had scale one and then the next uh, variable we label as nominal by accident, it'll tell you that we cannot run this test because it's not the appropriate variable measures for the test. So that's why it's very important to make sure your variables are labeled correctly. So as you see, whatever we did in our variable review is variable view is reflected in the actual data analysis screen, our data set screen. So this is how we're going to now test both data sets for normality. We're going to hit analyze. We're going to hit descriptive statistics. We're going to hit explore. And we're going to place both of these variables by using the arrow into the dependent list. And then it'll give you descriptives by default. And we want to click here, normality test with plots. And we're going to hit continue and we're going to hit OK. And then SPSS does a lot of beautiful things, right? So you know how in Excel we were manually trying to like calculate all these things and we were doing like descriptors function, but then we would have to calculate the confidence interval. SPSS just spits it all out for you for both data sets. So it's just a, like a literally a click away. Just you have to make sure that your data is labeled properly, et cetera. So we have our means for both data set. And we can already just start telling by looking at this, like our placebo group after six weeks still has a higher mean weight than our intervention group. So that looks promising for the weight loss drugs, but no assumptions to be made. Let's now scroll down to the next analysis SPSS did for normality. So if you remember in my first presentation, I talked about two different tests for normality. They're called the Shapiro-Wilk and the Kalmogorov -Smirov, Smirnov test. And both are, one is used over the other depending on the sample size. Generally for the cutoff for Shapiro-Wilk, if you have up to a thousand data points, you usually use the Shapiro-Wilk's test to test for normality. Otherwise you use the Kalmogorov Smirnov's test. So in our case, we're using the Shapiro-Wilk's test and it output our significance, which is our p-values for both data sets. As we see here, 0 0.07 for the first data set is greater than 0 0.05, and 0 0.03 is greater than, 0 0.03 is less than 0 0.05. So we have a case here where one of our data sets is normal, considered normal, and we have the other case where it's considered not normal. Now, just a reminder, in order to use the independent samples 2T test, that's the parametric test, both data sets would need to be normal. So in this case, we have failed that assumption and we can no longer conduct the two sample t-test. We now have to do, go to our non-parametric alternative, which is the man whitney u test. Let's act like we don't know what's going to happen next and let's just try to do the man whitney u test on SPSS. So I'm going to click analyze. I'm going to click non-parametric tests. See how important it is to use these terms because even SPSS knows them. Parametric non-parametric. So if you know you're going to do a non-parametric test, one of your best bets is try to just look under this menu. 
again, independent samples versus related samples. Related samples would be used if we're doing like a paired analysis, which we're not. When none of our people are paired here, we just have two separate people and two, two sets of people in two separate groups. So we're going to look at the independent samples option. Oh, yikes. This is one way to do it, but there is an easier way to do it. One second. Non-parametric legacy dialogues. Here we go. Two independent samples test. So I'm going to click on that. And notice, notice how this works. So we have a test variable list. We can put both of our variables in here. And this, leaving this grouping variable empty, but SPSS does not let us proceed. And why? Because it likes things in a certain format. So this is why Excel is your best friend. It's asking for a grouping variable because it wants to deal with only one variable which is broken down into your group one and your group two. So I'll tell you what I mean by that. So in this tab I called defined here, I copied and pasted the weights for both my group one and group two into one column. Everything's here together. But I distinguish them by creating a new variable called a grouping variable. And what that grouping variable does, it essentially tells you what group this particular entry belongs to. So for my first set of weights, it belongs to group one. So I label in this column the corresponding group for that entry. So this was, these were all group one entries. And group two entries start here. This is the entry for my second group. So SPS is very particular for certain variables. It wants the data available in a certain way. And this is why Excel is your best friend, because it would be very difficult to try to do this in SPSS. So what I'm going to do is these are my what I consider my two new data sets. I'm going to copy and paste this into SPSS, and that will allow me to run my analysis for Man with Me U. So I'm going to copy these simultaneously. I'm going to close these dialog box. I'm going to minimize the screen and I'm going to paste my data here. And this is why labeling becomes very important because it's going to become hard to track on when you're dealing with a lot of different things. So here my variable three, I'm just going to call it weights. And my weights are a scalar variable. And my variable four, I'm going to call it grouping label. And here, clearly, this is a nominal variable because group one represents something and group two represents something, right? So I'm going to click nominal. And then for values, we have one and we have two. Those are our values. And our label, this is group one weights and group two is group two weights. So once we've done that, I'm now going to rerun the analysis. So we're going to hit analyze. We're going to hit non-parametric text, test, legacy dialogues, two independent samples. And then you see we're clicking man with me you here because we know that's the test we use when we have two groups and they're non-parametric. Our test variable list is our weights that we've combined and the grouping label is here. Now it's asking us to define groups. So we know our group one weights was represented by the number one. Our group two weights were represented by number two. We're gonna hit continue. And all I have to do is hit okay. All right, so this is our man with me you output. It's giving us our two-tailed p-value. Just a summary. So Man with Me U, um, it uses something called mean ranks to compare. Our mean rank for group one, as we can see, was greater than it was for group two, which we expected because the weights were significantly greater after six weeks. And after it tested that for significance, we see the p-values less than 0 0.001. So again, how to interpret this? P-values depends on the question you're asking. So if you're asking whether there was a difference, Clearly, yes, there was a difference. If you're asking, was one group significantly greater than the other, all you'd have to do is divide this p-value in half, which is still less than 0 0.001. And you would still conclude that there was a significantly greater, there was a significant, the weight loss pill had a significant impact on weights in group two compared to group one, because group two had you know, much smaller weights than in gr group one at the end of the trial. Did I lose anyone at this point? Because that's what we did for Man Whitney U. Are there any questions or confusions? So with that being said, 
I'm going to continue with my slideshow. Okay, we went over SPS's data view, variable view. Again, all these slides are there for your reference, and the recording will be there here for two. Here's a summary of the steps for testing data normality. Analyze, descriptive statistics, explore. You click on plots, and you can check both variables at the same time. You have to ensure that both variables have a shapiro wilkes test value, p-value of p equals greater than 0 0.05 in order to use the parametric tests. Otherwise, you have to use the non-parametric test. Okay, that's just a summary. Again, Excel is your best friend for reformatting the data. If you ever get stuck, you define group one. So all the steps are very outlined there. So again, reminder, two-tailed p-value to detect whether there's a difference, one-tailed p-value to determine if a parameter in one group is significantly greater than the other group. All right, so now we're going to do repeat the same question, but we're going to use a different data set. So again, we have a pharmaceutical company that developed a weight loss pill, and we want to see if the weight loss pill had an impact. So we have a placebo group, that's group one, and then we had uh, the intervention group. That's group two. And we want to look at their weights post six weeks to see if the weight loss pill actually had an impact. But I use different data. So I'm going to stop share. I'm going to share my Excel document. Notice how this can get tedious because when you're doing the Shapiro Wilkes test, it makes it easier to have both data sets separately and different variable columns to do the testing. But when you have to do the actual t-test or man Whitney u test you have to have a group together. And this is why, again, I repeat, Excel is your best friend. So I'm just going to copy and paste both of my new data sets for group one and group two into SPSS so that we can test for data normality and determine which is the best test to use. So copy, control, paste. Then I'm going to copy group two for our second example. Then I'm going to paste. Now, to avoid confusion, I'm going to go into my variable um, view and label this. So we're going to name this group one, example two, group two, example two. And both of these, again, are scalar variables. Now we're going to do Shapiro Wilkes test. We're going to hit analyze, descriptive statistics, explore and then remove these, use the arrow to bring group one and group two here. Plots, normality plots already checked because we just did that, hit okay. Again, our descriptive statistics for group one and group two, and here we have our Shapiro-Wilkes test. So here, 0 0, 0.119 is greater than 0 0.05, check, we've passed. Group two, 0 0.058, is still greater than 0 .05, 5, 0 0.05, so check again. It's really close, but we have guidelines through which we work by. So we can conclude here that both of our data sets are normal. And since both of our data sets are normal, we can use the independent sample t-test. Now, we're just going to look at how we use the independent sample t-test. So I'm going to hit Analyze. We're going to hit Compare Means and Proportions. And we see it here. We have the paired samples t-test, but our data, data is not paired, so we're going to use the independent samples t-test. And look again, just like the man Whitney use test, it wants your data grouped. So I'm going to go back and copy and paste our group data. So stop share, and then I'm going to copy the group data. Again, all with the group data, all I did was literally copy and paste the two sets of weights. I put them in the same column. Then I created a new column in which I labeled whether that weight belonged to group one and group two. So copy. Now I'm going to reshare my screen and paste it into SPSS. I'm going to close the dialog box, paste. So I have variable seven is weights. I'm going to call it two because this is our second example. And then this is grouping two. And this is a scalar variable our weights, and the grouping is a nominal variable because each value in that group represents a different number. So where our group one represents placebo and our group two represents intervention. So now that everything is nicely in the format that SPSS wants it, we're gonna actually run the analysis. So I'm gonna hit analyze, 
I'm going to hit compare means and proportions, independent samples, t-test, and my test variable here is weights. And my grouping variable is grouping two. And then again, we have to define them as one and two. Okay, and I'm gonna hit okay. All right, so here is our output for our independent samples t-test. As we can see, our placebo had an average weight of 234. Our intervention group had an average weight of 190. And then we see a bunch of things in our output here, right? So we see a couple sets of p-values and something called Levine's test for variances. Equal variance is assumed, equal variance is not assumed. So the Levine's test, if you want to think of a parallel, think of it like the shapiros wilkes test. If your p-value is greater than 0 0.05, you can assume normality. Equal variance is assumed, simply as that. Since this is 0 0.782 is greater than 0 0.05, we can use the p-value, which equal variances are assumed, right? So if you were writing a paper in your method section, would be like, we use shapiro wilkes test to test for data normality, and then we use Levine's test to determine whether our variances will equal and that's the p-value we reported. That's where all that fancy stuff comes from the method section. If this p-value was less than 0 0.05, you would say equal variances were not assumed and you would use these p-values. Notice for the t-test, SPSS reports both the one-sided and the two-sided p-value. In our case, regardless of what question you're asking, did the intervention work? Were weights significantly greater? Were they significantly less? Was there a difference? all is less than 0 0.01. So our conclusion is that the intervention work, there's a significant difference in weight loss between the two groups. The one group lost significantly more weight than the other group. Did I lose anyone? Is there any questions? We're about to tie up now. I know that was a lot, but you know, learning SPSS correspondingly, I figure will kind of help people, okay? So I literally repeated the entire example on my slides so people can just use it for reference. Again, remember grouping is very important to SPSS. This is why S um, Excel is your friend. It helps you get that data prepared to put into SPSS. Equal variance is as assumed determines what p-value you use. Alrighty, so again, just the summary of steps in SPSS. You have to set up and label your data correctly because if you do not, number one, you might get confused. And number two, SPSS might not let you run the test. For example, if we didn't label that grouping variable as nominal and we labeled it as scalar, SPSS might not run the data because it'll tell you that that's not a nominal variable. It's not a grouping variable. It's a scalar variable. Both data sets have to be tested for normality using shapiro wilkes test. And you can only use independent sample t-test to compare scalar data only if the shapiro wilkes test is greater than 0 0.05 for both data sets. If even one of them fails that test, you have to use the man with EU test. Again, emphasis, ensure your data is in the appropriate formatting for testing and always use the most appropriate test because that'll provide you with the most robust results. And you have to always go back to your study question. If it's a non-inferiority trial, you're testing whether there's a difference. If you're trying to prove that something's better than the other, then you might want to use your one-tailed p-value. So now we're adding to our table. So for parametric data, when we're comparing ordinal or scalar data, we would use the independent samples t-test, also used, known as the student's t-test. When your data is non-parametric or skewed, one thing I forgot to mention, by the way, but you guys may have noticed, when SPSS output those descriptive statistics, interquartile range was reported, unlike Excel. So SPSS could be really useful for little things like that. When you have non-parametric data, you report, again, median into what's our range, and you use the man whitney u test, as would be determined by the shapiro wilkes test. So again, today we went over tests for ordinal and scalar data to compare between groups, and there are different tests for matched data and unmatched data. We discussed the scenarios today specifically for unmatched data or unpaired data. Please, again, remember, you have to use shapiro wilkes test to determine which of those tests to use, either the independent samples t-test or the man whitney u test. Independent samples t-test is used when both data sets are normal. You report your one-tailed or two-tailed p-value depending on the study question. And then remember, again, 
please set your data up correctly in SPSS. It'll probably make or break your analysis or your process. And I always will encourage you to use Excel for data organizing and taking care of inappropriately labeled values, et cetera, because it just helps your process in SPSS become so much easier. So that's all I have for today. I hope I didn't lose anybody. I see there's some things in the chat. Oh, people are saying thank you. Um, I'm so glad I didn't lose anybody. I really appreciate that. I hope rewatching the recording will help. If you're trying to like do an abstract or something, like it'll just show you how to do these things really quick. SPSS is actually very user friendly. You don't have to know how to program to do some basic analyses in it. So it's just really fantastic. And as we move along, you'll just see how awesome these capabilities are for like conducting research projects. So again, thank you so much. Lane and Lynn, did you guys have anything to add or any questions you think the audience might have that I should address right now? No, I just think it's really helpful how you actually break through the steps, like actually going through it and putting in the numbers. And I think just when people actually sit down and go through it again with their own data, it will really make a lot more sense because there isn't really a lot out there when they actually break it down and the practicality of it. So thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. Thank you. And I'm so glad to be of help. I feel like there was just so much things that I have to share that I feel people didn't know about it. So I'm really glad to have this opportunity. Thank you guys again. And again, the link to the slides are in the chat. And then I copied and pasted my fake data there too. So if you guys want to just replicate everything we did and play around with it, it's like all right there before you go live and do your own stuff. So again, thank you so much and looking forward to see a lot of you. Next session, we'll be talking about paired comparisons for ordinal and scalar data. Can't wait until next time. And thank you guys for showing up. Thank you, Christine. Awesome job. You're welcome. Have a wonderful day all. Good to see you. Looking forward to next time. We'll be in touch yeah. soon. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Take care. Bye-bye.